Honorable Speaker, I present the budget for 2023-2024. The budget this year has something for everyone. It is fiscally prudent. Amrit Kaal ka ye pehla budget विकसित भारत के विराट संकल्प को पूरा करने के लिए एक मजबूत नींव का निर्माण करेगा टैक्स रिलीफ फॉर द मिडिल क्लास इफ यू अर्न सेवन लैख रुपीज और लेस इन अयर यू डोंट हैव टू पे एन इनकम टैक्स द फिजिकल डेफिसिट इज एस्टिमेटेड टू बी फाइव पॉइंट नाइन परसेंट ऑफ द जी डी पी द मेन फोकस ऑफ द बजट इज टू हेल्प क्रिएट अ प्रॉस्परस एंड इंक्लूसिव सोसाइटी बाई ट्वेंटी फोर्टी सेवन Hi everybody on 4th of February 2023 our finance minister Mrs Nirmala Sitaraman presented the union budget of 2023 to the Lok Sabha and while most people might think of it to be yet another government policy i got to tell you that the budget is by far the most important economic event that every citizen must follow and understand because you know what it affects everything starting from your taxes your home loans your stock portfolio and even the cost of tomatoes that you buy and because business news in india is filled with jargons that no one can understand in this episode today we are going to use the simplest language possible to help you understand what is the indian government strategy behind this year's budget which are the key sectors and stocks that will be affected due to the budget changes what are the tax changes made by the government and most importantly i will also be providing you with some very important study materials to help you understand the core functioning of the indian economy better but before we move on i want to quickly thank our partners of this episode and that is small case people the budget is going to play a vital role in benefiting some key sectors in the indian stock market and if you want to make the most strategic investments into such specific stocks and sectors you must check out this beautiful list put out by small case whereby they have listed both the budget announcement and the beneficiary small cases along with these announcements and these small cases are nothing but a basket of hand picked stocks that are expected to have strong growth potential with the economic growth of india for example here you have the green energy small case which will benefit from the 35000 crores of government capex allocation and this rural demand small case which could benefit from the government spending to boost the rural economy of india and the best part is that the small case manager herself will rebalance these stocks with the changing market conditions so that you can get the best returns in any market situation so if you want to make the most strategic investments in 2023 check out these budget beneficiary small cases from the link in the description chalo the first thing you need to understand is the purpose of a budget people in simple words just like a company has to project its income expenses and the most important growth parameters that it's going to focus on when it comes to a country even a country has to come out with a budget that focuses on three parameters number 1 how will and how much revenue will the country generate in a year number 2 how will and how much expenses will the country incur in a year and thirdly what are the most important sectors that the government will be heavily investing into now for this year's budget the major focus has been on three important aspects number 1 fiscal consolidation number 2 is the tremendous increase in capital expenditure by the government and number 3 are the changes and rebates in the new income tax regime now as usual these might sound like complex terminologies but don't worry i'll explain it in such a way that even a 10 standard kid will be able to understand so let's start with something called fiscal consolidation fiscal deficit the fiscal deficit fiscal deficit fiscal deficit fiscal deficit belonged to nearly 60% of the full year it could narrow to less than 6% of gdp it is widened to 6.12 lakh crore rupees in the april september period and like always let's try to understand this using a story you see just like you need money to run a company even to run a government you need to spend a lot of money in order to achieve two important outputs Number 1 to build a conducive ecosystem for businesses to flourish and number 2 to achieve welfare for the people of the country. For example, the government of India spent 60000 crores to build something called the Golden Quadrilateral Highway. This highway connects four major cities: Delhi, Mumbai, Chennai and Kolkata. And this project that was built in 2012, now it is giving a huge business boost to Mundra Port which is connected to the highway of the Golden Quadrilateral. 
So trade and transportation has actually become simpler and factories in all four cities actually have a huge advantage by which they can actually ship goods faster and cheaper. This is how by investing into the highways, the government makes it easier and cheaper for businesses to flourish. And eventually, when these businesses earn more income, the government collects more taxes from these businesses. Similarly, the government has allocated 2 lakh crores to make food grains freely available for 81.35 crore people under the National Food Security Act. This, although doesn't lead to direct economic output, it is meant to improve the lives of the people of the country. These are the two outputs that the government aims to achieve, which are economic growth and citizen welfare. Now this begs the question, where does the government get all this money to spend on highways and food welfare schemes? Well, this is where we have the government sources of revenue. And here, firstly, we have the taxes, which are the most significant source of revenue for the government. And here's where we have income tax, sales tax, property tax, corporate tax, etc. Then secondly, we have fees and charges, which comes from license fees, permits and fines. Thirdly, we have sales of goods and services. Here's where the government generates revenue through the sale of land, public utilities or other assets. Then the government also earns from investments in stocks, bonds or other financial instruments. And lastly, we have the royalties that the government actually receives from natural resource extraction such as oil and gas or PSUs. So just like a company, the government makes money and spends money. Now if this revenue is more than its spending, then the economy is said to be a surplus economy. And if the spending is more than the revenue, then it is known as a deficit economy. So if you look at India, in FI 22-23, our government spending is 39,44,909 crore rupees and the revenue is 22,83,713 crore rupees. So we have a deficit economy with a deficit of 16,61,196 crore rupees. And this difference between spending and revenue is what you call as fiscal deficit. And fiscal deficit is usually calculated as a percentage of GDP. Now the question is, fiscal deficit is bad, right? And if we are spending more than we generate in revenue, then where are we getting this extra money from? Well, this is the reason why India takes loans from other countries, from bonds and international bodies to make up for this fiscal deficit. And this is not just something that India does, this is something that every other country does. So right now, the Indian government has taken loans from Asian Development Bank, International Development Association, International Bank for Reconstruction and Development, and the International Fund for Agricultural Development. So this is obviously bad, right? Because if we keep on increasing these loans, it wouldn't be too long until we become a loan burden country. This is the reason why the government actively works very hard to decrease the fiscal deficit. And this act of reducing the deficit is what is known as fiscal consolidation. So if you look at our fiscal deficit in the past three years, you will see that it has drastically come down from 9.2% to just below 8% and now it stands at 6.4%. And if all goes well, this year our budget estimates that we might even hit 5.9%. This is one of the most important objective of this year's budget, that is fiscal consolidation. So this begs the question, how is the government planning to do fiscal consolidation and how will it affect the industries of India? Well, in simple words, if fiscal deficit is spending minus revenue, if you want to reduce the deficit, you either have to decrease the spending or you have to increase the revenue or you can do both. So let's understand the first part of the fiscal consolidation exercise, which is expenditure. Now in the expenditure section, we have two types of expenditures, capital expenditure and revenue expenditure. Now the question is, what exactly is the difference between both of them? Well, in simple words, revenue expenditure includes the expenses that the government incurs for its normal course of operation, such as salaries, wages, supplies and other ongoing costs. These expenses are incurred to maintain the current level of government services and do not, I repeat, do not result in the creation of long-term assets. So if the government is paying salaries to BSNL employees, it's paying this money to keep BSNL running at present. But when you look at capital expenditure, it refers to the expenses that the government incurs to create long-term assets such as infrastructure, buildings and equipments. And these expenses are specially meant to improve the government's productive capacity and are seen as investments in the future. For example, like we saw, the expenditure for Golden Quadrilateral Highway was a capital expenditure. So even though it costed us 60,000 crores, it was completed in 2012 and it is still paying dividends for the economy of our country. So in short, revenue expenditure is for ongoing operations and does not result in creation of long-term assets. 
whereas capital expenditure is for investment in long term assets and aims to improve the government's productive capacity so in this budget the government has focused on increasing the capital expenditure of our country such that we can build cutting edge infrastructure to reap benefits from it in the next 20 years and if you look at the extent of this increase it will blow your mind the capital investment outlay is being increased steeply for the third year in a row which will be 4.5% of gdp the government increasing capex by a third it's called capital spending it's going up by 33% to spur investment in infrastructure and to incentivize them for complementary policies actions infrastructure roads ports housing projects that create jobs raise productivity and improve connectivity these are essential for sustaining india's growth with a significantly enhanced outlay of 1.3 lakh crores india is now pegged to be the fastest growing economy in the world while in fy15 we spent 2.5 lakh crores in capital expenditure in fy23 we'll be spending 7.3 lakh crores and by fy24 we would be spending 10 lakh crores into capital expenditure now most people might actually ask over here bro this is capital expenditure right so when we say that the government is going to spend 10 lakh crores how exactly is this reducing the deficit in fact this expense must be increasing the deficit isn't it well guess what this capital expenditure or capex is so valuable that for every 100 rupees spent on capex it leads to a gain of 250 rupees for the economy whereas with revenue expenditure these returns are less than 100 rupees so more the capex the more it will reduce the deficit of the country in the future now the question is if the government is going to spend so much money where exactly is it going to spend and which sectors will benefit from it and which are the key stocks to keep an eye on well firstly the government is extremely bullish to build infrastructure for the country so if you look at this graph you will see that the government spending on road sector is going to shoot up from 1.2 lakh crores to 1.8 lakh crores apart from that we have four multimodal logistics parks coming up and 100 pm gati shakti cargo terminals to be built in the next 3 years so the key stocks to keep an eye on are logistics stocks like adani ports conker mahindra logistics tci express and blue dot secondly 400 new generation vande bharat trains will be developed and manufactured and this will benefit the stainless steel sector so keep an eye on jindal stainless thirdly we have robust allocation of 7.5 lakh crores which is a 35% increase in capital expenditure and concessional tax rate for new manufacturing setups this will benefit the commercial vehicle companies and the stocks to keep an eye on are ashok leyland mnm and tata motors similarly the government has also proposed to come out with battery swapping policy with an increase in allocation to fame scheme from 800 crores in fy22 to 2908 crores and this is a very very big deal for the domestic av industry so the stocks to keep an eye on would be tata motors mnm minda corporation gabriel and greaves cotton similarly the government will be spending 48000 crores on affordable housing under the pm housing scheme and this will play a vital role for key stocks like canfin home avas home first and hdfc and just like this there are many more key stocks and policy connections so i'll just give you some study materials to help you understand them better This is how important capex is both in terms of economic growth and stock market investments. If this is very very clear to you, let's come to the second act to reduce deficit which is disinvestment strategy of the government. In simple words, disinvestment refers to the sale of government ownership in a public sector enterprise to reduce the role of government in the economy and promoting privatization. For example, we saw how the government sold Air India to the Tatas for 18,000 crores. Similarly, sales in 10 companies yielded 69,412 crores for the government in the last 8 years itself. And since 2014, the government has raised 4 lakh crores merely because of disinvestment. And this disinvestment strategy, ladies and gentlemen, gives the government three major advantages. Number one, instead of worrying about running the business, paying for salaries, and taking out loans for losses, the government can actually make a grand exit with thousands of crores in capital. and now all the government has to do is just chill and collect taxes when these businesses make a profit secondly the government can actually use this capital to clear the debt or invest it in better infrastructure projects and lastly when the privatization of an industry happens it by default creates a competitive market leading to both better growth and better value for the citizens a classic example of the same is the aviation industry in india so this year the budget has set a disinvestment target of 51000 crores in the budget 
This is the second way to reduce the deficit that is to use disinvestment money to pay the debts or to invest it in better capital expenditure. If this is very very clear to you let's move to the most awaited part of the episode and the budget which are taxes. 30 crore se zyada ke hamare desh mein sirf 1.5 crore log hi income tax dete hain. I propose to increase the rebate limit to 7 lakh in the new tax regime. Tax mein kami ki income tax aaj kaun de raha hai? 21वीं सदी के टैक्स सिस्टम की इस नई व्यवस्था का आज लोकार्पण किया गया है नाउ एज वी ऑल नो देयर इज एन ओल्ड टैक्स रेजिम एंड देयर इज अ न्यू टैक्स रेजिम इन प्लेस व्हिच काइंड ऑफ मेक्स इट कंफ्यूजिंग सो लेट्स अंडरस्टैंड दिस फ्रॉम द बेसिक्स एंड अंडरस्टैंड द टैक्स लैब्स यूजिंग अ स्टोरी एंड बाय एनी चांस इफ यू नो अबाउट ऑल दीस टैक्स लैब्स एंड इफ यू अंडरस्टैंड द बेसिक टर्मिनोलॉजीज ऑफ टैक्सेस प्लीज स्किप टू दिस टाइम स्टेप and for the rest here's a simple story let's say shubham is a salaried employee with an income of 20 lakh rupees per annum now under the old tax system he would be taxed as per the following slabs shubham would have been taxed a total of 5% of 5 lakhs minus 2.5 lakhs plus 20% of 10 lakhs minus 5 lakhs plus 30% of 20 lakhs minus 10 lakhs so this comes to 5% of 2.5 lakhs 20% of 5 lakhs plus 30% of 10 lakhs and this is equal to Twelve thousand five hundred rupees plus one lakh rupees plus three lakh rupees, which comes to four point one two five lakh rupees. So his total tax liability would be four lakh twelve thousand five hundred rupees. But now in the new tax system, Shubham will be taxed according to the following slabs. Here Shubham would be taxed a total of five percent of six lakhs minus three lakhs plus ten percent of nine lakhs minus six lakhs plus fifteen percent of twelve lakhs minus nine lakhs plus twenty percent of fifteen lakhs minus twelve lakhs. Plus 30% of 20 lakhs minus 15 lakhs. This is equal to 5% of 3 lakhs, 10% of 3 lakhs, plus 15% of 3 lakhs, plus 20% of 3 lakhs, plus 30% of 5 lakhs. This totals to 15,000 rupees plus 30,000 rupees plus 45,000 plus 60,000 plus 1.5 lakh equal to 3 lakh rupees. So now his total tax liability would be 3 lakh rupees per annum with the same income. Now if you have understood how these slabs work let's understand something called deductions. Now the fun fact is that in reality if Shubham earned 20 lakhs in a year that would not be his taxable income. This is because there are multiple additions and subtractions to this amount. Here's where we have something called cess and deductions. So as usual let's understand them with simple words. You see cess is nothing but tax on tax and cess is levied by the government with specific purposes till the time the government gets enough money for that purpose. This is generally for promoting services like health and education. For example in our case, cess on education is used to pay for students mid day meals, to establish government sponsored schools and institutions or to pay the salaries of employees in government schools and colleges. This is a percentage of the existing tax that you're paying. For example, if you have an income of 1000 rupees on which tax is 300 rupees, cess would be 4% of 300 rupees that is 12 rupees. So, this is an added tax. and then we come to deductions deductions are nothing but tax cuts that the government gives you provided you invest your money into sectors that are beneficial for you and your family this includes investing in healthcare housing retirement savings and many more as mentioned on the screen so if you spend or invest money in these instruments the government will not tax you for that amount of money if this is very very clear to you let's understand the difference between the old tax regime and the revised new income tax regime of 2023 for this let's consider three people parsh digvijay and anushree parsh earns an income of 8 lakhs per annum digvijay earns an income of 10 lakhs and anushree earns 15 lakhs per annum now firstly the government provides a standard deduction to all three of them in both tax slabs this standard deduction is the portion of the income of salaried individuals that is not subject to taxes and can be used to reduce one's tax bill It's currently at fifty thousand rupees in India. So let's subtract fifty thousand rupees from all three accounts of Parsh, Digvijay, and Anushree. So now their gross taxable income, respectively, come to seven point five lakhs, nine point five lakhs, and fourteen point five lakhs. This is the same in both old and new tax regime. So now we move on to the remaining deductions. Now, people, in this case, everyone's deductions are different, and for the purpose of this example, we make few assumptions that are similar to real life scenarios. So listen to them very, very carefully. 
We are making an assumption that all of them have investments under Section 80C in either one of the many investment schemes such as mutual funds or public provident funds or even the national pension scheme. And there are many such schemes that you can actually invest into. So on doing so, they get a maximum deduction of 1.5 lakh rupees. This deduction is only available in the old tax regime, which is why we only see a subtraction of the amount in the old tax column. Secondly, we are also making an assumption that they have medical insurance. So under section 80D, they are getting a deduction for the health insurance premium and preventive health checkup. Now this amount comes up to a total of 25,000 rupees per person. And again, it's only available under the old tax regime and not for the new tax regime. So you can see that the deduction has been made in this table for the old tax regime. Thirdly, we are assuming that Digvijay, who earns 10 lakhs annually, pays medical insurance premium on behalf of his senior citizen parents, giving him a 50,000 rupees additional deduction. And the last assumption we make is that Anushri, who earns 15 lakhs annually, is a homeowner and pays a home loan. So under Section 24 of Income Tax Act, she gets up to 2 lakh rupees of deduction on her home loan interest. So now that we have removed all the deductions, let's calculate the net taxable incomes of Parsh, Digvijay and Anushri. In this case, Parsh in the old tax plan after deductions has a net taxable income of 5.75 lakhs. So the tax in the old tax lab is calculated according to this table. So the total tax is 5% of 5 lakhs minus 2.5 lakhs plus 20% of 5.75 lakhs minus 5 lakhs. This is equal to 5% of 2.5 lakhs plus 20% of 75,000 rupees. This comes to 12,500 rupees plus 15,000 rupees equal to 27,500 rupees. And similarly, in the new tax plan, after deductions, he has a net taxable income of 7.5 lakh rupees. So the tax in the new slab is calculated according to this table. So the total tax is 5% of 6 lakhs minus 3 lakhs plus 10% of 7.5 lakhs minus 6 lakhs and this is equal to 5% of 3 lakhs plus 10% of 1.5 lakhs. This comes to 15,000 rupees plus 15,000 rupees equal to 30,000 rupees. Similarly, Digvijay has a tax of 57,500 rupees in the old tax regime and 52,500 rupees in the new tax regime. And Anushri's tax on normal income is 1.35 lakhs in old tax lab and 1.4 lakhs in new tax lab. If this is very, very clear to you, let's come to CES. CES, as we covered, is a tax on tax and currently it is at 4%. So let's calculate PARS CES. 4% of 27,500 rupees comes to 1,100 rupees and in the new tax regime, 4% of 30,000 rupees comes to 1,200 rupees. Similarly, we add CES of 4% on Digvijay and Anushri's total tax also. And here's where we arrive at a comparison of the old tax regime with deductions and the new tax regime without deductions. So now, Parsh, who has an annual income of 8 lakh rupees, pays a total of 28,600 rupees in the old tax lab and 31,200 rupees in the new tax lab. So this makes the old tax lab more beneficial for him considering he gets a maximum deduction value under ATC and ATD. Secondly, Digvijay, who has an annual income of 10 lakh rupees, pays 59,800 rupees in old tax regime and 54,600 rupees in the new tax regime. This makes the new tax regime more beneficial for Digvijay in this case. And remember, in our case study, we also added an extra 50,000 rupees as deductions for his parents. So if Digvijay didn't pay medical insurance for his parents, the gap between old tax and new tax would be much higher. And finally, Anushri pays 1,40,400 rupees in old tax regime and 1,45,600 rupees in new tax regime. Now two things to note over here are, this table has been made with safe assumptions, so use it only to understand the tax concept and not to file your taxes. And if you want to optimize your taxes, please consult a CA. This is the best example that I could find to help you understand the old and new tax regime for different income slabs. Now what I don't understand over here is the macroeconomics behind taxes and how exactly will the new tax regime increase the government revenue. So I'm not saying anything about it. But if you find some great study material, please feel free to share it in the comments. So if this is very, very clear to you, let's move on to the last segment of the budget, which are the miscellaneous government moves that can benefit or affect some important industries and stocks in the market. So here we have 60,000 crores of government money going into Jal Se Nal, which is set to benefit water engineering, procurement and construction stocks like NCC, PNC and KNR. After that, we have reduction in customs duty on cut and polished diamonds from 7.5% to 5%. And this would benefit the jewelry sector. So Titan company is a key stock to keep an eye on because they have Tanishq. 
Thirdly, Customs duty on acetic acid has been reduced from 10% to 5% which might negatively affect a company like JNFC because they are the largest producer of acetic acid but it might benefit key stocks like Lakshmi Organic and Jubilant Engravia. Similarly, decrease of customs duty on methanol from 10 to 2.5% might benefit alkyl amines and Balaji amines. And lastly, with the government pouring in 73,000 crores to revive rural consumption, if it goes well, it will benefit key stocks like HUL, Dabur, Marico and ITC. These are the most important takeaways from the budget of 2023. Now people, here's where many of you often keep asking us, what do you think about the budget? Is it good or bad? For those of you, I just want to let you know that it's not my job to give you an opinion and I'm not an economist, so my opinion anyways should not matter. So if you want to frame opinions, this channel is definitely not for you. If you want to understand concepts of business and economics, this channel is definitely for you. So this video has been made with the sole agenda to explain concepts of business and to help you understand Indian economics better. And now you're free to frame your own opinions. And now you may have a look at the study materials to help you understand the budget and its insights better. I hope this was very very useful and simple enough for you to understand. If you learned something valuable, please make sure to hit the like button in order to make YouTube ever happy. And for more such insightful business and political case studies, please subscribe to our channel. Thank you so much for watching. I will see you in the next one. Bye bye.